Bwrdd a pawb a diolch am y mynw yn ni am y web yna heddiw. Dyn ni'n mynd i trafod dyfodol gwaith teg yn Gymru. So good morning everyone, thanks for joining us for today's webinar. We're going to talk about uh, fair work today. Uh, my name's Joshua Miles and I'm the Director for Wales at the Learning and Work Institute. We're a charity and research organisation focused on lifelong learning and better work for all. Um, delighted to be here with our panellists to talk about the next step for Fair Work in Wales. But before we begin, I'd like to start by getting our audience's opinion. So uh, this is where the tech fails, so bear with me for one moment. I'm just going to share a screen. Um, but we've got a couple of Mentimeter um, questions for you that I'm just going to share now. So hopefully you can see that. So two quick questions that we're going to use to set the context for today's discussion. The first is going to be, do you think there's more fair work in Wales than there was five years ago? And we'll come back to the results on that uh, later on. But the key one for me is if you had one idea to deliver fair work, what would it be? Um, so to join the discussion on that, please go to uh, menti.com and type in this code or use the QR code here. Uh, my colleagues will also put the the links in the chat so it'll be easier to do it that way and if you're struggling for whatever reason put it in the Q&A on the chat and we'll pick it up somehow but I'm really keen to have your ideas that we can then put to our panel a little later on so, so that's our hope there. So why are we here then today? Well Fair Work's been a topical issue in Wales for quite some time starting with former First Minister Catherine Jones who established the Fair Work Commission to promote fair employment practices in 2018. The Commission published its Fair Work Wales report in May the following year, which was formally accepted by the Welsh Government. Uh, and there were 48 recommendations to improve fair work practices in Wales, which has since been uh, responded to positively by Welsh Government and the implementation process has begun. Since then, there's been a whole host of things that we don't need to rehearse, things like pandemics that have, uh, have gotten in the way of lots of things. But also we had a change in First Minister and Mark Drakeford, uh, who came in after Carwin, uh, committed to legislation on social partnership, which led to the Social Partnership and Public Procurement Wales Act, which is another significant step towards promoting fair work practices in Wales. Uh, the Act aims to improve public service delivery and wellbeing in Wales by working together to promote fair work practices. And across the UK too, there's been quite a strong focus on job quality in recent years with an emphasis on good work in England and a similar fair work convention in Scotland. Um, it's not a surprise really, the UK has been experiencing a period of economic stagnation with slow growth and high inequality, posing challenges in particular for low to middle income Britain's living standards. So in that context, job quality becomes all the more important. And I think it's fair to say it's likely to be a key issue for all political parties in the general election we expect later on this year. Uh, it's worth noting as well that discussions around job quality and fair work practices are not limited to Wales. Uh, the OECD, for example, tracks international performance against a number of job quality indicators as part of its an analysis of the future of work. Uh, the European Union has the European Pillar of Social Rights, which aims to improve working conditions and promote fair work practices uh, across the EU. It's got 20 principles, including things like the right to fair wages, the right to fair working conditions and the right to social protection. So uh, a key uh, element of policy there. And it isn't always about legislation either. Uh, culture can be a, a key part of it. So Sweden is, is an example that gets thrown around sometimes where they have this concept of fika, uh, which is uh, this custom where people gather to eat, to drink and talk. And uh, lots of Swedish companies have mandatory fika breaks. So that's an example of where uh, culture in a country or even an individual workplace can have a big impact on uh, how people's job quality or how employees experience the world of work. So lots to pick through there then. Um, what's next for Fair Work in Wales? Well, we've got a great panel of uh, contributors to, to talk to today, which will hopefully uh, generate some new ideas for us and help us make sense of the complex picture we mentioned. First, we're going to hear from Hannah Blythin, the Deputy Minister for Social Partnership. Then my colleague Naomi Clayton is going to talk to us a little bit about uh, the UK, uh, broader UK experience and lessons for policy for Wales on job quality. Kerry Jennings from Sparkles Cleaning is going to talk to us from an SME perspective uh, and Shivana Taj is going to give us the union perspective. Then we're going to hear from Ian Price 
uh, who's going to talk to us from a large employer's perspective. And we're going to finish up with a panel discussion led by Professor Alan Felstead, uh, where hopefully we're going to be putting some of the ideas we've gathered through the session uh, to the panel and coming up with a few few things to take the, the agenda forward. So so that's what we're, we're hoping to do today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Hopefully you've had a chance to uh, sign up on that link. Uh, and I'm going to pass over to the Deputy Minister. So over to you, Hannah. Josh and uh, and thanks to everybody who's been involved with organising this really important and insightful, hopefully insightful event today and to everybody who's taken the time out of their busy schedules to attend. I think I'd, I'd like to start my contribution today by sharing both mine and the Welsh Government's recognition of all of our social partners who very much you'll be hearing from during the course of this morning. Social partners, you've probably heard me and colleagues say before, has very much become a Welsh way of working and it's absolutely central to our aspirations of a Wales of fair work. And for me, I think that kind of way of working is now very much a distinctive dimension of, of devolution in Wales. It's how the way we do things, and it's the way we can work collectively by sharing a, a, you know, with our partners a common belief that a better deal for workers is central to a fair, more equal and more prosperous Wales. So... As a government, we're trying to and committed to using all the levers we have in our gift to promote fair work, but those levers will only take us to a certain extent. So the support and collective contribution of both employers, trade unions, and a whole range of partners, those combined efforts together is really, really key to making any progress. And I think absolutely recognise that we, of course, face um, many challenges now and ahead in the future. But I think we can reflect we have made some progress and we look at the legacy of the report of the Fair Work Commission in Wales and that continues to very much frame our approach. I'm, I'm really pleased that I am able to say and have been able to say for a while that we've actioned all six of the priority recommendations that were set out by the Commission in their report and we have put into practice or have work in progress on many of the remaining recommendations. But I'm not going to take up uh, most of my contribution today and people will be pleased. I'm not going to go through a point by point update on each of the 48 recommendations made by the Fair Work Commission, so other than to say that um, if uh, colleagues are interested, then a progress report is available online and it has details of progress against each recommendation. I hope to update the Senate on, on that um, next month uh, as well. And I think it's also important to say that whilst we're guided by that important work of the Fair Work Commission, we also recognise the importance and actually the need of being able to be agile and responsive to new opportunities and challenges. Because if we look back to when you know, the work was commissioned from the Fair Work Commission and when they reported, so much has happened by then. I think I, I saw once somebody say online, we quite like to live in a time which was just precedented rather than a series of un unprecedented events. But uh, work and the world around us has changed significantly since we set up the Fair Work Commission. So that means our approach has to change in the light of experience and the practical policy and legal considerations of two and with that in mind you know, fair work spans both what's devolved and what's reserved and obviously that poses challenges and constraints and what we can do and how we do it but we also um, have a better understanding of how the strength reach and impact of our fair work levers vary across different circumstances so I think if I can outline very briefly from our perspective, there are three tiers of influence, three ways of means of influence for us in Wales. Firstly, as a government, we have a more significant degree of influence in relation to the working environment in the devolved public sector. Secondly, and I think this is really important, we have some influence over those employers with whom we have a procurement or a grant relationship with. So that's the power of the public person driving the, the outcomes that we would hopefully collectively want to see. And thirdly, obviously, we have less influence of the majority of private sector employees just because of where our powers lie currently. But we do have the ability to kind of work collaboratively and persuade, but not to compel. And I think that for me and for my colleagues, it's why the work we do with trade unions and the commitment as a government to actively promote trade unions is really, really important. And, you know, I'm clear, we're clear that uh, trade unions are the most legitimate and authentic voice of people in the workplace. And for workers, we believe being in a trade union is the best way to protect our rights at work, improve pay, terms and conditions, to get training opportunities and to ensure worker voice is, is heard. But for employers too, um, we believe trade unions are a resource for partners in identifying and resolving workplace issues, improving health and safety and supporting workplace learning 
and enabling effective worker and employee engagement as well. In short, we see trade unions as not just a positive force in the workplace, but in Wales as a whole. And we've developed collaboratively new and um, exciting initiatives like the Unions of the World of Work pilot. Um, I'm really pleased to have had the opportunity to see some of those pilots in action and hear from the teachers and the young people that have been involved with that. And I look forward to continuing to see how that progresses as well. But what that does is make available resources to resources available to secondary schools across Wales and um, working to empower the next generation of workers, employers, potential entrepreneurs with um, knowledge of both rights and responsibilities in the workplace and the role of trade unions and actually the impact and the value of collective voice, not just in the workplace, but in um, the wider community and Wales as a whole. We've also worked to establish sector-based social partnership forums um, in the social care fair work forum and the retail forum. So whilst because of where we are, whilst those approaches do not equate to formal sectoral collective bargain, which we know would drive up standards consistently and at a, a wider scale, they do begin to demonstrate what is possible using our levers to facilitate and promote sector-wide conversations on employment practice and promote those kind of wider benefits from actually ensuring that workers are supported and the benefits that brings to a sector and to the economy as a whole. Generally, working in social partnership, it's a process that's a means to an end, but it is one of the most impactful and practical levers we do have at our devolved disposal in Wales to bring together government, business, trade unions to tackle the challenges that we know that we all face and to collectively work together to improve outcomes for the people that work within those, the people that serve in our public services and for the people of Wales as a whole. And everybody on this call will probably be aware that we have legislated very recently to put our Welsh way of working on a more formal footing with our groundbreaking social partnership and um, public procurement Wales Act. It was an act that was very much developed um, in partnership with social partners and I genuinely believe as it comes into effect, it will have an impact and influence as long as we work together beyond the public bodies that are captured by the Act, by the letter of the law itself. It will encourage better decision making, improve public services through social partnership working, promote fair work and socially responsible procurement. Um, the Act will actually come into effect in, in different parts. So the first thing we'll see is the establishment of a social partnership council. Um, this will actually meet, and I am quite excited about this, for the first time on the 1st of February. The Council will actually cement that formal voice for employer representatives and work representatives through the trade unions from across the public, private and third sectors. And actually, importantly, it'll have a crucial role to play as a sort of advice and influence to the Welsh Government and our policies and practices going forward. But it extends beyond that national level and places the duty on public bodies in Wales to seek can compromise or consensus with the workers through trade unions or with other represent worker representatives when they're setting their wellbeing objectives and making decisions of a strategic nature on the steps that are intended to deliver those objectives. In less kind of legal language, ultimately what that, that what that duty means is actually how we can work collectively and support the people that provide our public services to have more of a say in the stake what they look like what they look like and actually to support wider well-being in the workplace and in the community as part of that as well so that part of the act that duty will come into force in april this year and then public bodies will be required each year after that to report on the steps they have taken to comply with that duty um Running up to this, we are um, and continue to take undertake um, officials continue to take extensive engagement with public bodies and trade unions to ensure that um, we are able to implement that duty most effectively from from day one and hit the ground running. Because ultimately, we want this legislation to work in practice. Um, the Act also amends the Prosperous Wales Goal, Wellbeing Goal, and the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act by substituting fair work, de um, for substituting decent work, sorry, for fair work. Um, it, the amendment will, to the wellbeing goal will come into effect too on the 1st of April this year and it will require all public bodies subject to the wellbeing goal to review their wellbeing objectives. With that in mind, I think that will be a really important moment in terms of actually how we maximise the opportunities of that to ensure fair work in, um, in organisations across Wales. So to support that, we've published information on what we mean by fair work, why we think it is uh, beneficial, not just to the worker, but to the workplace and, and Wales as a whole. And also examples and sort of action, practical actions organisations can can take. Finally, the Act will place socially responsible procurement due to so many of our public bodies in Wales. 
they'll require what we call contracting authorities, include socially responsible clauses in construction contracts over £2 million and outsource services contracts wherever possible. Like I said before, it's about actually how we use those levers we do have at our devolved disposal through the procurement and the power of the public purse to drive those outcomes that we'd all want to see and that are beneficial to, to communities and workplaces and across Wales. Those provisions will not come into force before the end of this year at the very earliest. And that is because, not because we're, we're not doing anything, but it's because there is a, a, a considerable amount of work to do to make sure that we and our partners are actually best prepared to make the most of those procurement duties when they come into effect. So right now we're working with a whole range of stakeholders to develop the model clauses and other guidance, which are essential before the duties come into force. Because I've always said, whilst the act is important, um, change is not dependent on legislation because we're going to succeed in making fair work the norm and making fair work typical rather than all too often exceptional practice. We will need to see further change in cultural and behaviours. It requires progressive business leadership and management attitudes and we need employer role models who walk the talk on fair work and actively champion it to their peers as well. And we need to showcase fair work and share those best practices through inspirational case studies that we know are going to have wide reach and impact. So that's why the work of the Learning and Work Institute and many of the organisations who are involved today is so important to us as a government. And you recognise the importance of fair work in good business leadership, policies and white broader culture as well. And so I think the challenge for all of us is how we collectively spread that message, showcase, share good practice as part of driving that shift in behaviours, cultures and attitudes necessary to make sure fair work is um, disseminated far and wide within our own organisations. So finally, thank you very much for the invitation to join you this morning. I'm really proud, pleased I was able to. And um, I hope that the discussions generate those ideas and those actions that we can all work collectively on in partnership to make work fairer, more secure and rewarding for the majority, for all the people of Wales, Diolch and Brown. Lovely, Diolch, Deputy Minister. That's, uh, that's really helpful as a scene setter. And in particular, I like the challenge you left us with at the end, which I think is a good one for us to take through the, the event. How do we all work together to achieve this aim? Um, before we go to our next speaker, I'm just going to share my screen with the results of the poll. Uh, so this is where, again, the tech fails me. So hopefully this works. So can you see that? Someone give me a nod on the panel. Yeah, brilliant. So there we go. We got 21 responses and two thirds saying uh, yes, there is more fair work than there was five years ago. So I hope that gives you um, gives you heart and uh, encourages you, Deputy Minister, in that there's a there's a positive affirmation of of what's been happening there since the Fair Work Commission. So so good to see that. OK, uh, next, we will pass on to Naomi Clayton uh, from the Learning and Work Institute. Uh, over to you, Naomi. You're going to talk to us about job quality in the UK lessons for policy and practice. Yes, brilliant. Thank you, Josh. And I'm going to share my screen because <clears throat> I've got some slides. Hopefully you can see those. Somebody on the panel can. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, so um, as Josh said, I'm um, uh, Naomi Clayton, Deputy Director at Learning and Work, and I lead the organisation's work on job quality and in-work progression. Uh, we also host the Better Work Network, um, that has been funded over the last few years by Trust for London. So it's got a focus on um, London in particular, but it's got 800, over 800 members um, from uh, various uh, organisations um, across national, local, um, third sector, business representatives. Um, uh, and we work with those um, members to support evidence uh, led policy and practice around kind of job quality and in work progression. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about some of the kind of headline trends um, in job quality, talk about the framework we we use for for looking at different dimensions of job quality and what we know about what works to promote access to fair work. So, so starting with a good, good news story. Um, 
We know that uh, increases in the minimum wage have continued to reduce the prevalence of low pay. So the, the national minimum wage now, the national living wage is a big success story in terms of um, how it's worked to drive down um, the prevalence of low pay. And if we look here on this chart, um, uh, we can see that the proportion of people who are earning, uh, the proportion of employees who are earning less than the voluntary uh, living wage. So this is um, the rate that's set by the Living Wage Foundation based on the cost of living. If we look at that proportion, we can see that it's fallen significantly across all four nations over um, the last few years. And that's been achieved um, without uh, causing um, significant or, or without causing job losses. Um, so really positive story there. And we can see that the proportion of employees earning below the voluntary uh, living wage in Wales has dropped by over 13 percentage points since 2016. Um, so it's just below 12 percent um, in, in Wales. That was the latest figure in 2022. So um, the minimum wage is um, a, a big success story. But um, as Josh uh, was referring to, um, he was talking about economic um, stagnation. If we look at the kind of overall uh, trends in terms of wage growth, we can see that we're heading for nearly kind of two decades of lost wage growth. Um, so recent figures show that the slowing rate of inflation means that real regular earnings went up by 1.4% in the year to November 2023. But weak growth since the financial crisis in 2008 means that average earnings um, are around uh, £238 uh, per week lower um, than they would have been um, if pre-crisis trends um, had continued. So if wage rates had continued to grow at the pace at which they had been growing before the financial crisis, um, uh, the average worker would be around £12,000 per year better off. Um, so um, uh, kind of, you know, average wages overall have stagnated. And we know that many people get stuck in low pay as well and face barriers to um, progression. So just one in six uh, low paid employees move on to consistently higher wages over the course of a decade. And our research shows that women, people with caring responsibilities, uh, people with low or no qualifications and those living outside of London are more likely to get stuck in low pay. Um, so issues with um, uh, kind of wage growth overall and a lot of people getting stuck in low pay. And of course, that means that a lot of people are in in work uh, poverty. So um, uh, this chart here just looks at uh, the rates of in work poverty for, for individuals who are in work across um, the English regions and uh, UK nations. And we know that work is still the best way out of, of poverty, but it's becoming a less effective way of taking people out of poverty. So that's not that's not linked principally to the problem of, of the hourly wage or the, or the minimum wage, but really how jobs are, are constructed. So issues relating to hours and pay volati volatility and the insufficiency of hours in low paid work mean that many workers are struggling to pay to to make ends meet um, and in Wales as we can see on this chart more than one in six workers are in in work poverty um, so that's the fourth highest uh, rate of in work poverty among the English uh, regions and uh, nations so those are some of the kind of headline trends in terms of of pay and in work uh, poverty. Just move on to talk about our framework for looking at uh, kind of job quality in the round and different dimensions of job quality, because we know that pay is really 
only one element, albeit a really important one, of job quality. There are lots of other important aspects, including having sufficient hours, uh, job security, flexibility, and um, having a voice uh, at work uh, too. So um, through our work, we've adapted um, kind of a framework that was developed by uh, Carnegie and RSA um, to provide um, uh, and kind of develop a framework for, for measuring job quality and exploring um, policy and practice uh, solutions. And we use this framework to uh, track job quality in London. Um, we produce the Better Work audit looking at trends in uh, job quality in London. Uh, and we use it to frame our work within the Better Work network uh, too. And it looks at six main areas. So pay and, and benefits, so kind of things like pensions, holiday entitlements, sick pay, uh, terms of employment. Uh, there's lots of debate around the use of atypical contracts and zero hours contracts. I think in some circumstances, they can offer workers kind of flexibility and allow some individuals to obtain work that suits their needs. But of course, it can also lead to job uh, insecurity. And it's really important that any form of flexibility is genuine two-way flexibility. Surveys at least indicate that um, satisfaction with contract types um, is high. Um, another aspect uh, of, of, of uh, this element is having sufficient hours or at least minimum guaranteed hours so that people have minimum uh, a minimum guaranteed income and can plan um, around uh, work and their income. Um, we've seen progress on reducing um, low hourly pay as, as that previous chart illustrates, but that's not been matched by reducing low weekly pay. So we need to really look at sufficiency of um, hours and that kind of volatility in uh, hours and resultant volatil volatility in pay. The third element we look at is job design. So that's looking at things like skills utilization, levels of autonomy. We know from uh, surveys that workers have experienced falling levels of control over their work over the last uh, three decades. Um, and we also look at opportunities for progression uh, created through kind of career pathways and training and development opportunities. And I'm gonna come back to, to this uh, shortly. Um, voice and representation is the fourth aspect. Um, broadly, this means ability, uh, workers' ability to express their views, uh, opinions and concerns and suggestions at work. And for these, these um, uh, perspectives to influence uh, decisions at work. And this really forms an integral part of fair work, improving well-being and motivation. And it also provides a way to improve work experience and the overall um, quality of work too. Of course, we've seen um, union trade union membership um, decline over the past four decades, although that decline has slowed overall in the UK and Wales has a relatively high rate of um, union membership, or that, although that has been falling uh, too. The fifth aspect is uh, work-life balance. Um, so we know that having a poor work-life balance impacts workers' capability to manage mental health, physical health, childcare and and caring responsibilities and personal relationships. Um, our previous estimates suggest that one in 10 workers would prefer to work shorter hours, even if that resulted in less pay. And then the last aspect is around health and well-being. And all of these dimensions of um, kind of job quality are um, interdependent, um, but health and well-being is obviously uh, a key part of um, kind of job uh, 
uh, quality um, and we know that workers particularly in terms of workers mental health workers have been affected by rising levels of work intensity and stress within the workplace so those are our um, uh, kind of measures for looking at job quality and thinking about policy and practice solutions and ones that we've used to um, assess trends in uh, job quality conscious of time so I'm going to move on to talking um, a bit about one aspect of um, uh, the, the dimension on uh, kind of job design and the nature of work and one aspect of, of this is um, the degree to which employers are investing in training and workforce uh, development and we know overall um, uh, if we look at figures from uh, the employer skills survey that fewer employers are investing in training we've seen this uh, trend across England and um, uh, Wales and that really can affect um, uh, you know, kind of investing in workforce uh, training and development can improve people's ability to, to do their job, increase levels of job satisfaction, and obviously also provides opportunities um, for progression. Um, so those declines are concerning from that perspective, but also from a, a broader kind of economic perspective uh, too. Um, so the proportion of employers investing in training in Wales has fallen to 60%, which is on the par with um, levels in uh, England. Um, interestingly, investment per employee has increased in Wales. Um, but we also know that 40% of employers in Wales don't train their staff and 42% of those uh, employers who aren't providing training don't provide other forms of development opportunities either. Things like job shadowing or um, giving uh, staff additional responsibilities. Um, we also know that one in eight employers only provide health and safety or basic um, kind of induction training and that there are large inequalities in access to training and development opportunities. So graduates are four times more likely to access um, uh, workplace uh, training and um, the sectors that tend to invest the least um, have tended to cut the most uh, in terms of their investment in training and workforce development over the last decade. Um, so we really need to look at how we might reverse some of the declines in employer investment in training and address some of the inequalities too when we're thinking about improving access to fair work. And there might be something um, in, in kind of thinking about the kind of role of the social partnership forums um, and the role that they can play in uh, trying to address some of these issues. So just wanted to touch on kind of what we know about what works to improve um, access to fair work and drive up um, job quality. And this comes from some work that we did with the Poverty and Inequality Commission in uh, Scotland, where we conducted an evidence review uh, looking at um, uh, particularly impact evaluations that could tell us about the impact of, of different initiatives and policies. Um, and we can we know that kind of in general, when we look across the UK and further afield, that there's been a lot of emphasis on kind of fair work standards and charters and promoting fair work through public procurement. But when we look at the evidence, there's a general kind of lack of evidence um, around these areas um, in relation to um, uh, their ability to uh, impact uh, job uh, quality. So we found that there were uh, no impact evaluations on social procurement. There was some evidence on uh, the impact that higher uh, public uh, sector pay has on uh, levels of kind of job quality in the and pay in the private sector. Um, and uh, we found that um, procurement in uh, adult social care that uses fair work guidance uh, guidelines as has been used in uh, Scotland 
can improve uh, wages amongst social care workers. Um, uh, but lastly, despite the kind of growing number of standards and uh, charters, um, there's no evidence uh, identified on the impact of those charters in relation to uh, fair work. Um, so as we're moving forward, we'd really like to see greater emphasis on trying to understand the, the impact and effect of, of those um, initiatives. There are a number of other types of initiatives that has, have been shown to improve uh, job uh, quality and increase access to fair work. So things like uh, developing career ladders um, can increase job quality in poorly paid um, sectors. So there's a program in the US uh, to support the development of career ladders and other training initiatives for frontline um, staff. Um, in uh, the care sector um, where kind of small increases in responsibility were matched with small increases in pay. And there were a range of positive uh, impacts identified from that. We've also found that um, tailored business support for organizations in the care sector um, can um, improve uh, people's experience of um, uh, work. So, it's work done in Glasgow um, uh, where they provided um, uh, support to uh, organisations in the care sector to improve their, oper their operations and through this support staff to progress in earnings. Um, and that was shown to have a range of benefits, although mixed views on the impact, on the direct impact on progression. There's quite a lot of evidence on the role of occupational skills training. Um, so uh, found that kind of making substantial skills investments in low income individuals can enable them to get the right job and progress in work. And this may well be more effective than um, your kind of typical work first approaches that are then followed by in work uh, support. Um, programs like Work Advance in the US um, have really had a significant impact on um, people's uh, kind of earning uh, progression. Um, so there are programs like that that are worth looking at and, and seeing whether we can um, replicate those in the UK. We also know that high performance work practices can improve uh, job quality. So things like um, uh, employee autonomy, self-management, decision-making, uh, appraisals um, can uh, improve. There's substantial evidence on the benefit to employers and it can also improve uh, job quality. I would say though that there's less evidence on the impacts of policy in supporting businesses to adopt high performance work uh, practices. Um, and then lastly, there's also evidence around um, the role of employee ownership models. So things like um, uh, cooperatives or employee owned businesses uh, that can increase and uh, uh, kind of pay and, and improve job quality in poorly paid uh, sectors. So those are just uh, a few examples of where there is um, evidence and, and good evidence on uh, promoting access to fair work. And then just lastly, just to touch on some of the policy implications of this, um, I started off by talking about the minimum, minimum wage being a big success story that really needs to be positioned within the kind of broader um, kind of good work or fair work uh, agenda um, with steps to support um, job quality, such as promoting sectoral collective bargaining agreements. So it's great to see the progress that's being made on that in Wales. Um, I see in, in part because there is some concern that increases in the minimum wage may lead employers to cut other forms of benefit. So we really need to look at um, kind of different forms of and different dimensions of job quality in the round. Um, I would say that, you know, Purchasing power and procurement leadership on fair work can 
and could support the creation of more fair work. Um, but it's, I think it's really important to try to understand um, the impact of, of uh, those um, initiatives and policies going forward. Um, uh, we would advocate for um, more kind of testing and evaluating of initiatives to promote fair work. I've highlighted the example of work advance. Um, and then also supporting those groups who are most at risk of poverty and in in work poverty to access fair work through things like quality employment support, infrastructure development, so things like childcare and transport, and encouraging the creation of fair and um, flexible jobs. And this is really about giving um, individuals more choice about the jobs that they do and the choice to leave a bad job. Um, so think you know, and thinking about fair work, we really need to be thinking about kind of wider, broader support for in individuals and, and that infrastructure. And then of course, crucially important to continue to work with employers to promote employee engagement, empowerment, and also skills development. So I will stop there. That's wonderful. Thank you, Naomi. And I'm just going to push you, as I am with everyone participating today, what's your one idea? So if you had one idea to take this forward, what would it be? I think one idea I would link back to what I was saying about testing and evaluating um, initiatives. I think there is uh, quite a lot of evidence around things like um, uh, work advance and programmes that um, kind of really uh, kind of invest in uh, individuals in terms of kind of training and intensive work support and I think we should be doing more to see if we can replicate those successes. That's brilliant thank you so we've got one idea in the bag then there we go great um, okay let's move on then to we'll Kerry next who's going to give us a small business perspective so over to you Kerry I think you've got some slides to share for us haven't you? I'll just unmute. Uh, thanks, Josh. Yeah, hopefully I've got some um, slides to share. I'm not very technical, so um, I'll apologise in advance. And my, to my other dismay, I left my glasses at home. These are a spare pair. They're just reading. I can't, <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling today, so my apologies. Right, OK, let's see if I can do this. We can see your slides. Uh, you just need to put it in presenter mode, I think. Okay. So start the uh, the presentation. Okay, that's I'm having trouble with that. Bear with me just a second. If not, we can just do it this way. That's fine. You can just click through. We can still see. Okay. No worries. Okay. So shall I just start? Sorry. Go for it. Yeah. Okay, so um, okay, so thank you for having me. Um, it's great to represent small businesses um, in Wales. Um, so today I'd like to talk about our commitment as a company um, to be an ethical employer and what it actually means for us. Uh, what's our experience of fair work and what needs to change within Wales? Then I'm going to talk about employee representation and development. And finally, I'll share the challenges of implementing this. So Sparkles is actually celebrating 21 years of um, being in business. So yay. <laughs> um, and we're, we're primarily uh, now a commercial and um, cleaning uh, company, but we did start off in the domestic sector. Um, and I founded uh, Sparkles back in uh, 20, 2003 because basically family members kept asking me to do their cleaning. Um, you can imagine what my response was. Um, and obviously, you know, 20 years on, here I am. And speaking to you lovely people about my business. We are a living wage employer and we're a disability confident, committed employer. We're committed to continuously developing our workforce and, and the working environments to ensure accessible 
and inclusive inclusivity for all. And that's founded basically by um, a, a bit of a personal story. So um, my daughter, uh, Sophie, um, has cystic fibrosis. She was a late diagnosis um, with this. And at the age of 13, we went to see one of the consultants and they basically um, said, uh, if you're ever well enough um, so to have employment, don't tell anybody that you've got a disability. And I just thought there and then, actually, you know, you, you're writing off somebody. You, you just, you're just saying people are just going to look at a disability rather than the person and what that person can actually do within, um, within, within work. Um, and it was, and it was part of me thinking there, there has to be, there has to be a better way. I'd like now to talk about um, our employee representation um, within Sparkles um, and what we do. Um, so we moved from individual feedback um, to a Sparkles Works Council, meaning that we come together to hopefully share solutions and not just problems. We trial, um, for example, we've trialed new equipment and um, one of the ideas came up from some staff was having better access for their um, holiday entitlement. So we, we, we've done that for them. Having a dialogue with the directors helps everybody understand why decisions are or aren't, aren't made um, and understanding the cost of doing business and coming up with solutions that are not only good for them, but actually good for the business. It brings a feeling, a, a feeling um, with, uh, of ownership, understanding and inner entrepreneurship within Sparkles. Employee development is really important for us. Um, and Helping and supporting and encouraging people is a real privilege. Last year, Sparkle supported six members of staff who completed their MVQ Level 2 in cleaning. And this year, we've already got another nine signed up for MVQs and one for an ILM. Sorry, get my teeth in. <laughs> um, and this is our lovely Phil and what Phil had to say. I would like to thank Sparkles for being given the opportunity to enhance my career since joining them. I have been given plenty of support and have been fortunate enough to gain CSCS, Triple STS and PASMA, and now a level two in City and Guilds cleaning and support service skills. I can now carry out my duties safely and with full confidence. Once again, thank you. And that and that's from Phil. So he's he's um he's been with us for a while and obviously has gained those qualifications. So we're we're really proud of Phil. Staff retention. Our cleaning staff turnover is just under two percent, which is unheard of in the cleaning industry. Our sickness rate is under three percent. I want to talk about why we're an ethical employer. Fair work is about listening to what matters to people and what's the point of it. There are many reasons to have a fair work in practice, the real living wage, employee representation, employee well-being and employee development. But let's face it, we've, we've struggled like others to implement this. But while we've had challenges, we've also had gains. So while we've lost some customers, we've actually gained on our staff retention, which is really important for us. That's, that's, that's a picture of us lot that work in the office. So it's not, it's not about us, it's about the people that we employ. So this is Louise. Um, and uh, Louise shared this with us. You've got the statement there on screen, but she also gave us this statement. I really enjoy working for Sparkles. They are a friendly bunch of people. The office staff are just a phone call away and always very understanding and welcoming if there's any problems. There is always someone available if you ever need help or anything, whether it be over the phone or, invite, or for advice or in person. It really helps being paid the living wage 
and receiving profit shares. Receiving above the real living wage enables me to afford comfortably for me to allow my son to go to France. And that, that was a real, um, uh, you know, turning point for us to actually realise that just having that little bit extra in somebody's wage packet means the difference between um, somebody sending their child on a, on a school trip or, or not. This is Kezia. Um, and Kezia is a, a valued member of staff. She's been working for Sparkles for close to five years, helping people into employment. It comes from a real help, a real want of um, trying to help other people. Having the real living wage makes a difference to me as I can work fewer hours and get more time to spend with my children. She does have three of them. I, I have had a word with her. <laughs> And this is, this is our lovely Sean. She turned 60 with us this year. Her experience and knowledge is an asset to Sparkles. Fair working, leaving someone in a better place, whether it's from wages, people development or representation. At Sparkles, people are the heart of the business and are paid the living wage, regardless of age or experience. Sparkles is a... Is a, is a Sorry, start again, my teeth in. Sparkles is a living wage accredited company and shares profits twice yearly. We listen to understand what people want. Regardless of the awards or the bigger business one, if you have employees, at the end of the day, you are in the people business and having the opportunity to implement a fair work in practice. We have chatted today about being an ethical employer and fair working, the living wage and employee representation and development. And I just like to say thank you and hopefully I'll be able to shut down my screen now. <laughs> That's thank wonderful. You. Uh, thank you, Kerry. That's great. And I, I've got three children myself, so I've got a lot of sympathy with, uh, with the words Kezi has uh, shared with you there. Um, congratulations on 21 years. That's, that's a huge success. Well done. Um, I'm going to push you, same as I did for Naomi. So what's your, your one idea? If you had one idea to drive this agenda forward, what would it be? One idea on, so so for me, and I think um, one of the biggest things that, that we do is that we, regardless of, of age or experience, I just touched on it a little bit, we pay the same. And I've noticed that other companies will will not do that. They'll, they, they will literally have the youngest members of staff on the lowest wage that that they that they possibly can and then build up and i don't think that it's that it's that, that it should be you shouldn't pay, to, to me you shouldn't be penalizing someone for for being young or someone you know or, or giving benefits to someone who's got more experience i i think i, I think it's you, you know a youngster can have as many outgoings Mm -hmm. and you know want to get a mortgage as 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 anybody else and i think for us it's it's, it's leveling up that playing field i think yeah wonderful thank you carrie that's that's really good and thanks for your contribution to the discussion today so okay uh we're pretty good on time so that's great i'm going to pass over next to shivana from wales tuc who's going to talk to us uh, about the perspective on fair work from the trade unions. And I know you've had a busy week, Shavana, haven't you, with uh, report launches uh, that I'm sure you'll mention to us uh, in your contribution. Dioch, uh, Josh, um, uh, and uh, Pal. Um, so I'm going to be talking today a little bit about um, our Wales CUC take on uh, the need for us being very consistent and support in uh, that is that the Wales TUC has itself been a, a very open and clear advocate for fair, wo uh, fair work in Wales. We've shaped um, our major campaigning asks for the last five years or so. And we've also been very clear that we want Wales to have its own definition of what a good job is. Lots of people talk about fair work, good jobs, etc. We wanted to make sure that we're capturing um, all of the various different elements of decent work um, that are contained within the ILO definition, which 
um, also reflects the labour market and the policy context as well. Now, the Fair Work Commission actually did this already. It is in their definition. So we were really glad and are glad that this has been adopted by Welsh Government. And that really highlights fair reward, talks very much clearly about collective voice, security, safety, progression, inclusivity, many of the you know fundamental uh, crux of labour rights in particular. And for one thing, this has meant that it's put an end to that debate about what fair work is uh, or actually was. And it's now moved us on to the discussion that we're having today, which is how do we actually make work fairer? So we're really encouraged by uh, the steps that the Welsh Government has taken uh, since uh, working with social partners to make uh, work fairer, especially in the devolved public sector, uh, where uh, the government has um, the most uh, clear influence, uh, particularly in relation to cross uh, public sector agreements on issues like zero hour contracts and actually um, other things like leave for domestic violence survivors, for example. Um, those have been really excellent examples of this. And government has continued to find alternative avenues as well um, to make uh, work fairer overall. They've invested in unions, for example, in the World of Work program. Uh, so uh, that is specifically so that young people can learn about their role um, of uh, what it is, what will happen uh, when they enter into the workplace for the first time, what are their rights at work, um, but also about trade unions and their role um, in and amongst all of this as well. Um, and the other thing uh, that the government has done is ensuring that the new commission for tertiary education also has a clear duty to engage with unions. And that is yet another example how they've committed to making sure the workers are seen as equal social partners, um, as is the response uh, to the strongly um, opposition um, and limiting the impact of the UK government's uh, current minimum service legislation. Now, the ambition to make Wales a fair work nation is one that Welsh Government has consistently pushed at. They've really kind of pushed at the boundaries of devolution to deliver on this. They've recognised uh, the deep sense of inequality that exists in our labour market. Um, and this is also set against the backdrop of Wales now being committed to delivering on social justice and, for example, becoming anti-racist by 2030 as well. Now, Josh has mentioned uh, several reports, um, one of those being the last week that we launched the final report of the Wales TUC Independent Commission on De Devolution and, and Work. I posted up a link in the uh, chat uh, to that as well. And that report very much uh, explored how the um, current settlement that we have is delivering for workers, or what more we could actually do to improve labour market outcomes. Now, the Commission focused on how the devolved settlement and existing legislation that is going unenforced at this stage can be fully harnessed to create the sorts of conditions where workers are then able to determine the right pathway for them. And it set out how Wales's labour market can begin to be strengthened and rebuilt. And by exploring some of the core themes um, of labour rights, institutions, but also enforcement and how that looks, um, and why, it's that, why it's absolutely necessary that any um, outcome, including um, if we move forward uh, and we have further devolution, um, that we don't um, just continue to reinforce existing labour market failures as well. And this needs to be very much the kind of like the jumping point for um, our movement as well. Um, where we've also always said the Union Movement of Wales has always been very clear uh, that we need to um, approach uh, this with our eyes wide open about some of the risks and, and many of the speakers previously have talked about some of the risks and Naomi touched on uh, some of the big issues um, in her presentation as well. We need to be very much careful given how, how we mitigate some of these whilst protecting what workers have already won because there have been some wins that have been secured as well. So how do we build upon what we already have uh, rather than kind of like rubbishing everything and starting again? Because I think there is a bit of a fine balance here. And doing so really gives us an opportunity now to create a very distinctive, um, much more progressive, um, an equitable, a fairer labour market in Wales as well. And we can take advantage now of the potential opportunities, of course, to insource workers into the public sector in Wales. When Hannah, the minister, spoke, uh, she also made references uh, to this in particular. Um, you know, the move towards privatisation, the outsourcing of workers those things have been a major factor in undermining workers' rights uh, and accountability over the last 40 years. 
And now it's important also for us to consider with the prospect of, um, you know, a, a change of, of government at a UK level um, and the UK Labour Party having committed now uh, very openly to the biggest wave of insourcing in a generation. You know, they've also talked very clearly about making work pay by introducing a new deal for working people that includes the banning of zero hour contracts, ending fire and rehire, but also creating well paid jobs across all parts of the country to make working people better off and more secure. We then need to think about how can we consider how we seize this opportunity of change then in Wales and what will that mean for for Wales? What will that mean for our economy? What will that mean? Uh, what will that mean for uh, for workers as well? And Professor Jean Jenkins' uh, recommendations um, focuses very uh, very clearly and radically on reshaping our labour market institutions within Wales. And she's talked about um, the need for investment and pivoting the devolved state towards rebuilding those uh, very important conditions that are necessary for workers to access their basic labour rights. Um, and I also want to make a note of her recommendation on how the Wales TUC should now be building on its own capacity to look, look at some of the practicalities of potential further devolution as well. And of course, um, uh, you know, uh, tomorrow there is going to be the uh, the launch of the independent uh, report into the future of devolution in Wales as well. So again, as as uh, one of the individuals uh, that uh, was privileged enough to be, to be um, sat on that commission, um, you know, I encourage everyone to get involved in that as well, uh, to, to watch out for that. There's still going to be an opportunity to continue to engage there too. But coming back to um, uh, what I'm discussing here today, one area where we are especially keen now to see is a step up in our approach, uh, specifically in relation to public spend. Um, and again, uh, previous speakers have, have touched on public spending, the procurement aspects of the Social Partnership and Public Procurement Act as well, are then going to be really important. It's an impor important opportunity, it's a really good lever for us to look at how we um, can make work fairer as a result of billions of pounds that are currently being spent every year by devolved public sector bodies. Um, and we also want to see a consistently ambitious approach to take uh, taken as far as grant funding is concerned again. Um, and, you know, we often talk about the public sector, private sector in Wales, but there there is the third sector as well. And there are a number of people um, who work within that sector, delivering um, on work on behalf of the public sector. Again, um, you know, they are big issues there in relation to the lack of fair work, um, the lack of consistent um, approaches uh, to uh, co contractual obligations there as well for individuals. So there are things that we can do. Um, and of course, employment charters have been mentioned and employment charters um, are, a, are a good initiative and, and we're very keen to borrow from that, uh, building on that sort of like something for something approach uh, the Welsh Government has continued to champion. And it's quite similar to the um, economic contract that's been developed in Wales. Charters are a bit of a soft power tool. And, and let's be clear, they are a soft power tool. It's an opportunity to bring uh, lots of different voices together to, to get everyone around the table. Um, and if, they do, if they're kind of co-produced um, by social partners with the aim to give support and recognition to good employers, I think they, they can be. Um, they can go some way in helping create the right conditions for um, the implementation of fair work and for us to become that fair work nation. But they often, you know, they often provide advice and guidance for employers and employees, trade unions and local authorities, um, amongst others, to evaluate and improve um, employment quality. So it's not just about having uh, fair work jobs, but it's also about the quality of those jobs as well, the flexibility of those jobs, etc. Uh, whether or not, for example, you know, are um, individuals able to have access to uh, the, if if necessary, for example, if people have caring responsibilities, can they ask their employer to be able to work from home, have some more flexible working in place as well in terms of their hours, etc. as well. And of course, childcare, caring responsibilities, all of this then comes into play as well. And, you know, um, adhering to charters as a precondition of any procurement can also reward these good employers as well by facilitating their access to public contracts in the first place. And this can also play 
an important role in encouraging sign up amongst employers who have um, who would not otherwise have been um, you know inclined to improve the working conditions that they've offered particularly um, in the absence of any where you have you know strong national employment legislation as well so in terms of um, you know socially responsible public procurement social partnership more broadly the charter model as a precondition I think does make sense uh, Welsh government have already laid the groundwork uh, with the legislation here as well but where we want to move things forward we want to make sure that the risk of unfair work is also minimized as much as possible and that will happen if social partners are working with procurement teams and trade unions to kind of monitor and ensure compliance of any sort of charter to charter related commitments um you know we've got for example we've now got a, a charter uh, for retail if we continue to, to keep everyone very much focused um on that by you know contracted organizations and we can help people understand and document the overall impact of the charters i think that is how we make fair the fair work agenda kind of shift it along from just being an ambitious policy to actually evidencing the outcomes for all workers across Wales. And that's where we can actually genuinely begin to shift the dial. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Shivana. So uh, you give us quite a few uh, examples there and you did mention um, uh, public sector investment as a key area. So, uh, but I'm going to push you again, like I've went with everyone else. You have one idea if, if you had one. Oh, Narrow it down. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's back to um, enforcement. And, and okay. compliance yeah yeah brilliant thank you that's fantastic um i've seen as well there's lots of sharing going on in the chat that's brilliant please do keep that up and if anyone else has uh, ideas they they want to put in or, or papers to share please do that it's, it's very useful um right okay last but by no means least we've got ian price who is the director at cbi uh, cbi wales so over to you ian uh, before we go to our panel discussion yeah, thanks, Josh. Um, it's always a challenge going last because I'm sitting here with my notes and I'm scribbling and I'm thinking, well, I can't say that now. I can't say that now because so much of what I was going to say has already been said. But I, I suppose that's positive in some respects because it, it shows how much agreement there is across this agenda anyway. And I, it was fascinating listening to, to, to Naomi, Kerry and Shav and, and, and see how much we agree on. So I think that's really positive from a fair work perspective. So. Yeah, and Kerry's presentation was wonderful, and she did it really well, even though she had the wrong glasses on. I have to say that was quite an achievement. So well done, Kerry. Um, yeah, fair work employ, fair work for employees in Wales is really important. You know, the the working environment's changed such a lot as a consequence of COVID, and we've seen that the advent of hybrid working, and that's brought its challenges. And 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 we're still finding a way, of finding how how to make it work in truth. You know, you talk to so many employers on. A, an almost daily basis, and they're still struggling with the challenges. I was in with the business yesterday, and and they were they were keen to get people back into work in a, in a fair and equi equitable way, because it was starting to impact on their on their operations on a daily basis. And and you can see this on on on, on regularly. I'm I'm seeing businesses now impose, uh, you know, uh, insisting that people come in at least two days a week or three days a week. So, so these are challenges that COVID has brought and, it, and it's due to us. So, um, um, mate, you know, to get this working properly, you, you, you hybrid particularly, you know, we need productive businesses and, and we need the personal development of staff to work. And, and I, I think that's being challenged with respect to COVID at the moment, or certainly the effects of COVID. There have been real problems with the development of young people through hybrid working. The chat by the printer or the water cooler has been lost, the walk between meetings uh, that used to happen when you would review your discussions or, or you've just had. These moments were really invaluable to the development of the workforce. And hybrid doesn't allow you this, unfortunately. Sometimes it's a question of what's efficient against what's effective. Hybrid work has also added to the challenges of addressing you know, the problems of mental health and the support in the workplace, because it's really hard to see on a screen, you know, how people are struggling and how they're getting on and, and, and things like that. And employers have really been challenged by that through, you know, through the ev evolution of hybrid working. But yeah, it's, it's difficult. We've gone through a period where we've seen a really tight labour market, where recruitment has been very tough for employers. This is now eased. 
But we're now seeing people in the job market being far more discerning in what they're looking for from an employer as a result of this. These days, to be a successful employer, you have to have the right offer for your current workforce and for any future potential employees. Your benefits package has to be right. You have to create the right working environment. You have to be flexible regarding hours and patterns where practical. I'm a great example of a, a, a compressed hours. I actually work compressed hours now. Um, so, you know, that, that's a really positive. And, and, but I'm not very good at administering it because my day off is a Wednesday. And I'm on this call at the moment, so it's not suggesting the idea is great, but in practice, I'm not very good at uh, managing myself. But yeah, these are the sorts of ideas that are really going to work going forward. This very much encourages business to be fair work employers because the labour markets are tight. Most CBI members pay at least the real living wage where possible. And, and, and more often than not, they pay more than that. A high percentage of our members pay over and above that. And, and it isn't all about wages. Average wage increases are sitting at 6.6% this month, with inflation at 4%, which is good news for employees, but there are still over 900,000 vacancies out there. And CBI members are still telling us that there are skill shortages in key areas such as IT and engineering. This is concerning when we've just heard about the cuts to apprenticeships in the recent Welsh Government budget. We'll we will continue to lobby strongly for a rethink we appreciate that this year's sees a tight budget settlement, but we must prioritise the young people for the future of the Welsh workforce. And I, I, this is coming through from so many of our members at the moment. I see Ben nodding as well. You know, it, it's a real worry because, you know, we're, we're developing our workforces and if we're reducing the amount of money there. Of Naomi slides as well that suggested less and less employers were training. So if the budgets are being cut, there's going to be an impact going forward with regard to that. So hopefully we can encourage Welsh Government to have a rethink with respect to how they fund apprenticeships. Myself, Ben and Shav have sat on many meetings over the last few years where we've discussed what we can do to look after workers in Wales. And we've made some real progress. You look at the establishment of the Social Partnership Council, which has been mentioned on numerous occasions already uh, from the Minister, from Shav and, and others. Uh, and, you know, where employers, trades unions and governments sitting around the table are looking for solutions. As an offshoot, we've seen the creation of the Retail Forum, Forum and the Retail Strategy. This has already seen an improvement in the working environment of people who are working at the sharp end of retail. They see the worst of people on a daily basis, unfortunately, and they deserve to be respected and looked after. They were also heroes during COVID, and I don't think they got the recognition they deserved. I think most people now really value our retail workforce. I think most employers in Wales are fair work employers. They may not use the term, but they do the right things. We must capture all the best practice going on and use it to come up with a more universal approach to fair work. I think Shav mentioned this and, and you know, she loved practical ideas about how we do that. But there are some really good examples out there of what employers are doing. And I'm seeing more and more innovation all the time. It will benefit us all and make our jobs easier. If we want to address the challenges of the Welsh economy, a well-motivated, happy work workforce will go some way to achieving it. It must be important. It's important that we must not let the bad behaviour of a minority of employers tarnish the rep reputation of the majority in Wales. There are lots of good employers doing lots of good things. And I think we need to focus on that and, and find those examples and develop on them and create a fair work environment going forward. But I'm conscious of time, so I, I didn't want to go on too long because I, I know we wanted this at least 30 minutes to, to take questions. But thank you, everybody, for your, your time this morning. Cheers. Well, thank you, Ian. And I can think of nothing better that I'd rather do on my day off than join Learning and Work Institute for a nice, heavy policy discussion on fair work. So uh, we, we know what a fun guy you are now. Um, I'm going to push you, like everyone else, if you had one idea, what would it be? I think one of the challenges I come across and, and, and my members talk about all, all, all the time is it, you might not believe this, but it, if the challenges and the cost of childcare, mm -hmm. if they could address the challenges and the cost of childcare, we would see so many people come return to the workforce and, and we could address that challenge of those 900 vacancies because I'm sure there's some really skilled people at home at the moment who simply can't afford childcare to, and, and, and as a consequence can't return to work. So if some, somehow we could use the Fair Work agenda to address that challenge, I think 
there's a real opportunity. And if yeah. we can do it in wheels, it'll give us the edge over everybody else as well. Yeah, I mean, you look at the economic inactivity figures for Wales, it's higher than the UK as a whole, and it's much higher for women than it is in men, and that's largely driven by caring responsibilities. So, yeah, I agree, there's a huge opportunity, really, to do something positive in that space, I think, um, but one for the, the discussion. Okay, we're going to go to the panel discussion now. We're going to hand over the reins to Professor Alan Felstead. I should say we've got Ben Cottam joining us as well from FSB Wales to form part of the panel. Um, Alan, we've got lots of good suggestions uh, from the survey we did at the start. So perhaps come back to me in a little bit and we can pick through those. Dim plum logable. Diolch yn fawr iawn i Bob un o sioeabwyr y blaen orol. Vum enw ydy Alan Felsted yn byddai un cyderio y sesiwn sgwrs hwn. Uh, thanks very much to, to all of the previous speakers. Uh, my name is Alan Felsted and I'll be chairing this uh, uh, discussion session. Uh, we've had some big ideas from the uh, four speakers and, and I'll get to them uh, in due course. But I think it's probably proper if we have, I, I asked the question to Ben, who's joining the panel, uh, to give us his big idea because so far he hasn't been able to do so so if he could throw that one in the pot uh, first of all Ben that I'd be very grateful. Yeah I think my 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 sort of dial-up for particularly from a small business perspective would be to better organize our networks to uh, share the information so I'm really struck with Kerry's example uh, we're having a conversation um, with an FSB about the role of things like the Good Business Charter and B Corp so you know, they, they are charters, they're frameworks that have, um, that, that look at responsible business in the whole and as a core part of that, these conversations around fair work. And it's, there's a need for businesses to go and take their own conversation. Welsh government has only so much resource and our business support infrastructure has only so much resource. So we need to organize ourselves to take those conversations and embed some of this practice ourselves. So I think, and that's something that we are looking at at the moment as FSB would be interested to talk to businesses over the coming year on that. Thanks a lot for that. I do think that actually dovetails very neatly and nicely with Naomi, uh, actually, if I can bring you here. Uh, I expected you to say a little bit more about uh, the London Better Work Network, because it has in its title Network. Uh, and I wonder if you could share, us, share with us something about that and maybe lessons we can learn uh, from that network uh, here in Wales. Maybe we should do something similar here. Yeah, um, thanks. Alan, um, uh, and kind of really, really interesting points raised by the other speakers that have um, given me lots of food for thought. Um, but the, the Better Work Network, as I mentioned, um, was previously funded by Trust for London. So primarily had um, uh, a London focus to it, but the membership is wider than that. And um, and it includes, as I was saying, kind of members from, from kind of national government uh, departments, local authorities, through to kind of third sector representatives, um, trade unions, and um, uh, kind of other kind of third sector organizations. So a real mix of, of different organizations represented, all that have a, an interest in the kind of fair work agenda and job quality. Um, and it's all about trying to share kind of best um, best practice and evidence around kind of what works in terms of, of uh, policy as well. And um, throughout, we've really tried to, as I was mentioning when I was talking about the framework, looking at different dimensions of job quality, really tried to make sure that we get a good balance. for So looking at those different issues of um, kind of job quality. So we focused previously on things like in, employer investment in training and uh, voice and representation in work, working particularly with um, uh, kind of TUC and um, other organisations uh, seeking to support collective bargaining. I think one of the lessons that we've really learned going up throughout is, is kind of making sure that we are very aware of the external environment and the kind of policy environment, because obviously there's a kind of advocacy um, element of what we do. And so we're trying to influence kind of 
um, uh, kind of the government um, agenda, but also listening to workers and the issues that they're facing. So the work that we do as part of the Better Work Network is supported by a lived experience um, group. Um, and they meet on a quarterly basis um, and really help um, uh, us to shape the agenda for the Better Work Network and, and think about where we need to be focusing our efforts. So one of the big issues, no surprise over the last couple of years, has really been cost of living um, and the degree to which employers can support employees with kind of cost of living uh, challenges and the role of wider kind of policy makers too. So um, through the work with the, the kind of lived experience group, we've we've had a particular focus on trying to understand the impacts of the cost of living crisis on low income workers and what more can be done to support uh, workers. So I would say that um, I think kind of over time, one of our big lessons is, is making sure that we're listening to workers in terms of how we kind of shape and focus our work. Okay, thanks a lot for that. I, I, wouldn't you say though, I mean, in a way, we have some form of that already in the Social uh, Partnership Council, uh, consisting of many of the people around this table and listening to this uh, uh, session now, but probably it needs to go wider than that. I mean, the network seems to be much wider, 800 you say, I think, members, that's much wider than the Social Partnership Council. And I suppose the challenge might be for the Social Partnership Council, do we get those, the voices of workers? Do we hear the voices of workers? Do they hear the voice, the individual voices of employers? Uh, could I ask that to Shivana? Do, do, is the Social Partnership Council uh, working effectively to uh, garner those views, garner the views of the lived experiences, to use uh, Naomi's uh, comment there? And thanks, Helen. So, um... The Social Partnership Council's uh, first meeting um, is due to take place shortly. So we haven't had the first official meeting yet. So far, we've worked um, on the basis of a social partnership during the period of the pandemic in particular. Um, and that brought together a variety of different people to the table. And what we all did was um, we all came, I think each of the social partners did everything that was within their power to bring evidence to the table. Um, so whether and that did um, uh, that did include, of course, lived experience. From our perspective, we would be consulting the 48 affiliated unions. We also work uh, closely with non affiliated unions as well um, on a sectoral basis, coming up with what are the key issues and how are they impacting people um, on the ground. Um, and where is it that actually there is a bit of a problem and offering a potential solution as well. So I think that's the other thing. It's, just, it's about feeding something in, but then you have to offer um, a possible solution and then be prepared for that possible solution to be discussed and to be debated. Because, I mean, that's the whole point of social partnership, right? It's about collaborating, working together and trying to figure out whether or not we can move forward on that suggested idea. Otherwise, it's just an idea and it doesn't go anywhere. But um, social partnership, of course, then doesn't take away from the uh, what happens at a collective bargaining basis. So there's already sectoral uh, bargaining, for example, very good structures that exist, particularly in the devolved public sector. And so the social partnership model um, doesn't necessarily take away from that either. So people have a variety of opportunities um, to bring evidence to the table, to, to make sure that uh, the views of workers are understood. The other thing that we do very regularly is we run polling. Uh, we do a lot of um, outreach to areas where we don't currently have a unionized footprint. Um, we'll run sessions that are open to people who are not yet members of the union. Um, and we did a lot of this sort of thing uh, during the pandemic as well. And I think that the one thing that we demonstrated, is, as Ian has mentioned, that there were so many times that, you know, Ian, Ben, myself and others would be on a platform together. And whilst it, it may not have been that every single thing that we were saying was absolutely exactly the same, because we do, of course, come from sometimes a slightly you know different point of interest. But overall, we did, I think, uh, develop a, a position where sometimes actually it did feel like we were all on the one side going, this stuff just isn't going to work. And we had government on the other side going, 
what is going on here? Like all of you guys are actually in agreement on the following. So you do have this kind of, I, I think that we're in a, and that's healthy. It's healthy to be in that position. I don't think that one person has all, all of the answers either. So I think collaborative working, partnership working means that, you know, we can find a way of, in, you know, making improvements. Right. Okay. C can I ask Kerry actually, as a, 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 a as a small employer, a very inspirational presentation. You've got lots of thumbs up in in the chat, uh, which I echo. Uh, as a small employer, um, how, do you, how do you feel as though you have much influence uh, going up towards uh, the Social Partnership Council and Welsh Government? What's your experience of having some kind of influence or your voice? Is your voice heard? You're on mute. Go ahead, Kerry. Oh, you're on mute again. Sorry, still on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, can hear you now, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, start again. Technical issues. Um, so yeah, other than other than being invited to um take part in talks such as these, I, I don't I don't think that that we're represented um enough. So um a bit like um Ian was saying that you know businesses, a lot of businesses are doing um really good things. Um, and 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 fair working, you know, um, uh, just one of them. We we um, like Ben mentioned. So we we're part of the Good Business Charter, um, but that again, you know, not a lot of people know about the Good Business Charter, what it stands for. Um, so yeah, I th I think better representation from 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 small SMEs and and you know and and um, you know and and the larger companies out there. There's, there's some of us doing re really, you know, good things. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. So, I mean, if I come to you, Ian, on that same point, uh, how how are we going to uh, make the good practice that you talked about visible um, so that others can follow? And I think somebody also mentioned the word uh, championing, so we can have champions. I think Shav actually mentioned champions uh, to kind of tra trailblazers to make the case uh, make the business case for fair work. I think it, it it's happening to a certain extent at the moment, and I, I think the challenge is that business people, particularly, are, are are time poor, and and the difficulty is you you create another tier of of networks, and I think there's an absolute danger that you you don't get what you want to hear because people don't engage because they simply haven't got the time, and and to a certain extent, I, if I bang the drum for business organisations and. and you know, like the FSB and the CBI, that is our role. And to a large extent, the TUC's role with respect to the workforces. So it's up to us to relay these positive messages. You know, I'll be some of the stories that Kerry's recounted today about what happens at, at, at Sparkles. I, I'll be telling people in networks for, for, for months ahead about Sparkles and, and the positive things they do. And this is this is how we do it anecdotally. We're raising these issues all the time in, in different conversations and saying, you know, that there's a there's a cracking story about an engineering company up the valleys that there has been a CBI member for years. And, and the real challenge for them was diversity within the workforce. They were really struggling. You know, it's a very male dominated environment. It's engineering and, 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 you know, they want to address it. They want to bring more females and, and, and into the, into that environment. So they invited in brownie groups to this engineering company, you know what I mean? And that is so innovative and, cle and clever, you know? And it's a very simple idea. And there's lots of these examples. And I recount that story on a regular basis because that's the way you're going to get people thinking differently is, is with e examples. People look to other people to see what they're doing and learn from them and then replicate it. And that's, that's, the, that's the way forward to a large extent. So I, I, I'm not sure creating more networks to discuss it is, is the best Way. I think what we need to do is we need to rely on people like Ben and, 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 and Josh and people like that to get out there and tell people about what, what's being done. And, and, and as Kerry, you know, as I said, after today, I'll be telling everybody what sparkles. So. OK, thanks for that. Yeah, I think we all will. Uh, um, I mean, I think one, one thing I, I, I my, my kind of little uh, kind of uh, uh, 
contribution to this debate is, and I think uh, Naomi, you touched on it, uh, and several others touched on it as well, the lack of evaluation, uh, the lack of sh demonstrating that things make a difference. Uh, and I don't know whether, and this is a plea to the Social Partnership Council and Welsh Government, in fact, uh, that I'm not sure we're making it as much use of the academic community and the research community as, as we might. Uh, our kind of trade is to evaluate. Our trade is to evaluate independently. Uh, our trade is to bring to, for, to, to fruition case studies, e exemplars. And I, I don't think we do enough of that. Um, would you agree, Naomi, that that's a kind of something that we need to do when we could do? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was the other kind of one of the other big lessons from the Better Work Network is just that kind of lack of really kind of high quality evidence on what works um, to improve uh, job quality. And I think going forward, um, we need to look at how we can evaluate and improve the evidence around things like um, uh, kind of public procurement and the other kind of initiatives uh, that uh, are being kind of implemented at the moment. You know, I was struck when we were looking at the evidence around charters and standards that there's a lack of, uh, of evaluation, but quite often there's a lack of just kind of fairly basic monitoring around kind of who's signing up to these charters. You know, big question mark for me is how um, do these kind of charters and kind of work that's that's going going on around kind of fair work guidance reach beyond the usual suspects so beyond the businesses like sparkles who are already implementing these types of things within the workplace and i think clearly as ian has said there's a big role for um uh business networks in this space but i also wonder if there's there's um uh kind of other ways to reach businesses like kind of looking at those kind of common touch points so you know uh you know businesses work with accountants and banks is are there other ways to to reach businesses and can can we as kind of work continues be better at monitoring and evaluating um uh those initiatives yeah thanks for that. i mean i was always struck uh i have been struck recently by the adwife campaign from the Future Generations Commissioner and it's an outreach uh, project really that is trying to engage the academic and research community in its work uh, and I wonder whether Welsh Government could do more of that. Uh, I also note that the Senate has its area of areas of research interest but so far I don't think Welsh Government does and certainly in this space uh, it could quite easily issue a areas of uh, research interest and an academic community and researchers, I'm sure, will be able to fill a kind of some kind of um, evaluation gap, which I think you've uh, uh, identified uh, there. Um, I wonder whether I could go back to a point that Shav, uh, you mentioned, uh, and certainly Jean Jenkins mentioned in her report, which is the issue of enforcement. Uh, and I think that was your big idea. We should do more on uh, enforcement, uh, and we do to probably too little. How realistic do you think it is that Welsh Government can and will take action in that area? So it, I, it's an idea at this stage. So uh, we've um, yet got to go through an internal process uh, with our General Council and uh, with our um, union membership uh, to have that big conversation about, OK, so this is an idea that's come forward. Realistically speaking, is this something that um, the Welsh Government can do immediately? Is there another way of doing things? But it is, but it is an idea that I think is important for us to consider. And it's not like we haven't done some of this stuff before. So, uh, for example, you know, uh, Welsh government's invested in uh, PCSOs. Uh, we in invested more so during the pandemic in, in environmental offices, etc. Um, and given that there isn't enough, um, there's been a major cut at a UK government level in enforcement. And if we have that ambition to make Wales a fairer nation and where fair work is, you know, seen as extremely important, then I think you have to 
kind of put your money where your mouth is and create the right conditions for for all of this. So yeah, I I think it it, it is definitely something worth considering. Going back to the point that Alan you were making about um, academics, um, funnily enough, talking about um, a, a different matter, but a matter still that still relates to to good work conditions. So um, uh, I was talking to uh, some of my colleagues uh, at Bosch government actually in relation to. Um, tackling sexual harassment in the workplace. And th this is as part of the about SV agenda and, and the subgroup specifically looking at workplace sexual harassment. And what we were saying is, is that actually what we need to do is to work with um, academics um, in this space to do some evaluation, to look at what it is that employers are already doing. Um, where are the gaps? So we can come up with our, our take on where we believe the gaps are, but actually having regular contact with academics from across the whole of Wales who you know understand these issues and can help us evaluate on a regular basis would be really helpful. And I think having that um, oversight and implementation then group as a separate is healthy. And I, I, I think that's that takes you a long way, which was why when we did our, when we commissioned our report, we were really keen that it wasn't just a desk-based exercise that we did, but actually, let's have somebody else look at this for us. So I think it's healthy, definitely. Okay, C could I, uh, there's some very interesting uh, comments in the chat. I urge people to have a look. Uh, Stephen Lane has put a, a link into a, an evaluation of uh, the charters in, in, in England. Uh, I, personally, I think there's more to be done in that area. Uh, but can I bring Ian in? You put something in the chat about your worry about charters. What What's from your point of view the, the, the worry you have about charters? It, it does concern me over the years because we've had lots of different things that we've got employers to sign up to. And, and, and sometimes it's seen as the end of the journey. Mm. So, yeah, I've, I've signed up to this or I've met these criteria. You know, I, I'm, I can fold my arms now and watch everybody else. And I... And I it, that is my concern around charters. That they're, they're sometimes misunderstood. It's, it's 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 quite often it should be the start of the journey, not the end of the journey. But I, I don't think always employers see it like that. And and you know, I, I see some good examples of employers that embrace things. I you know use Admiral as a point in fact as a good employer. You know, and they they they're in the top two hundred and fifty employers in the UK to work in every year consistently. Yet they don't sign up to many charters. So I, I, you know, you can achieve things without signing up to charters. And I think there's a danger sometimes that employees sign up to a charter and think, job done, let's move on. And I, I think that's where we need to be careful. Okay, can I bring Ben in? I've just seen your hand. I hope it's not been there a long time, but I was bring, going to bring you in anyway. Uh, ben. Yeah, just on that on that point about, yeah, it's the start of a journey. They have to be actively monitored. And then we have to capture the data, as you say, Alan, about the number of businesses, their experiences of the charters. I think what the charters do do, though, is create a market response to this. Um, we are only going to go so far if Welsh Government is telling businesses what to do. We have to realise that actually very few businesses, as a proportion of overall the business population, have either any grant relationship with uh, with Welsh Government or any supply chain relationship have very few touch points with Welsh Government. So we need to activate businesses to think for themselves, to act for themselves in a way that's, you know, that's, that's relevant to their marketplace. And I think what some of the charters do do is allow them to organise themselves as response around the responsible business agenda that helps them not only engage uh, with employees. And I was really struck by Kerry's point about uh, engaging with employees, creating entrepreneurial behaviours, and that's a really important one for, for, for all organisations. Um, but it also allows them, you know, within a private sector supply chain to compete for, for you know, sort of work around, uh, you know, a, a, around different environments. So I think, you know, there is a responsibility that we do put on businesses to activate themselves because we will only get so far if Welsh Government or any other government is, is directing this because there are comparatively few touch points that most businesses have with government. So I think going back to the earlier point about Kerry's earlier point, there's absolutely a role for FSB under the social partnership model and under our, our cooperation with partners there to take some of these conversations out. But I think we have to have these conversations in ways that are relevant to the sectors that we're talking about and are easy, you know, and are measures that are easy to activate, particularly for, for small businesses. 
does that mean then, Ben? I'm pushing you on that. That you see, you do see a role for charters, for the sound of it, uh, but they have to be kind of sector specific uh, rather than generic. Because the charters that that have been discussed in the chat here are kind of generic uh, and of a particular region, uh, rather than actually a sector. No, I think I think if you look at the Good Business Charter and B Corp, there's two examples and. Um, I should say we we had a, a conference last uh, October and, and Kerry actually came in along and spoke to it and you could see the lights going on across uh, some of the some of the um, uh, some of those that attended and we asked actually the question you know, sort of how many businesses are actively looking at charters or interested in looking at fair work and and systematize it under charters and hands went up all over the place so I think there's a real interest there's a real understanding it gives businesses market advantage. In tight labor markets, it, it allows you to demonstrate your commitment to the employee or offering to the employee. So I think you know the, the, the problem is if we break this down by segment, if we break this down by region, what we do is confuse the marketplace. Having something that is as applicable to all, that speaks to responsible business, dare I say across the UK, particularly for those businesses that trade around the UK, I think that is, that is an area of, of work that FSB is interested in looking at. Well, that's interesting. I mean, I, I, so again, you, you're talking about a charter that is UK wide uh, rather than Wales wide. And of course, there was a recommendation in the Fair Work Commission's report to look at a public facing uh, employer standard. Uh, and I don't think it's going to be, is it, well, according to the last uh, update was it's not being, it's not taking it forward on that basis, but uh, looking at alternatives. And this could be an alternative. I think we'd want to see where existing models can be relevant to the agenda we're taking forward in Wales. But I think, I think you know, there is an exciting landscape for this. And I was really motivated at our conference by just how much interest there, there was among our membership in this. Sure. Well, I mean, just this conversation and the fact that uh, Shavar Nataj raised it as well suggests, notwithstanding uh, kind of Ian's uh, misgivings, uh, that, 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 that there might be kind of a space for uh, for something like this to... to uh, uh, be established, uh, hopefully, uh, in Wales, but actually UK wide. At this point, I'm um, we're moving to. Uh, oh, Ian, could you? I'll bring you in here. Yeah, just to, just to agree with Ben that what it, whatever it is, it's it, UK wide makes so much more sense because you know you've got you've got you look at Northwest, we uh, Northeast Wales, we've got such a porous border. You know, people are trading across those borders all the time. You know, if you've got if you've got different charters for different parts of the UK, it, it just creates confusion. So, uh, as if we're, if we're going to go with it, it, a UK wide one makes far more sense than you know, ploughing our own furrow to a certain extent. Okay, thanks for that point of agreement. I think we're, we're at eleven forty-five. Uh, Josh, uh, can I bring you in? Um, maybe to to close the uh, discussion and or add uh, some other ideas to the pot yeah absolutely so let's um let's add some other ideas to the pot first i think that'd be a good exercise so let me go back to my survey uh hopefully you can see this someone give me a nod yeah great fantastic okay so we've got 14 ideas i'm just going to whip through them really quickly because i think it's worthwhile better enforcement so we we had that one from shavan already so that's a, a reiteration of that uh supporting apprentice uh wage levels so there's a long-standing issue there uh review of zero hour contracts to provide more security for individuals uh, more on job training greater appreciation of the role of trade unions uh, more investment in work in in work education and training uh, more apprenticeships so apprenticeships topical issue today as you'd expect uh, support for unpaid carers to return to work or to continue to balance work and care which is the point ian made i think as well uh, have training for all employers and employees so they understand uh, what fair work means further develop the progress already made in developing a workplace culture of openness and transparency around mental health. I find that really interesting. Culture is a really tricky one. You know, I, I think we've spent a lot of today talking about the good things that government does and policy does, but how you get that culture is a much, much trickier thing, isn't it? So maybe something for us to come back to on a further discussion. Uh, proper consideration to a Welsh pilot and a four day working week. Now there's a big idea for you. Um, 
in this day and age, uh, the need to upskill and continue our professional development is greater than ever before. My idea would be to promote the benefits of training and development. So that's a well-articulated one there. Uh, education and industry to co continue to work together, creating training programs and skills interventions to upskill and increase talent pipeline. So skills again. And then employee ownership trusts. Uh, so they're increasing in Wales and evaluation of their contribution to fair work could prove beneficial to our fair growth aspirations. So uh, a couple of things in that, actually, the ownership model, uh, evaluation of that model uh, and really seeking out the benefits of that. So so there we go. There's lots of good ideas there. Um, we've run against time, uh, I'm afraid. So we're not going to be able to go back to the, the panel, uh, Alan. So we'll draw a draw a close at this point. But just to say thank you, first of all, to all of our panellists for the contribution. I think this has been a really, really good discussion. I've been struck by the degree of consensus between everybody involved. And I think we've generated some good ideas. Uh, for our part, we'll feed these back through to the Deputy Minister uh, and to the wider policy discussion, hopefully. That's that's our plan. Um, we're really keen as Learning and Work Institute to work with others on this space and hopefully keep this agenda moving because I think it is something that needs continuing attention. And as the Social Partnership Council starts its work, hopefully we can ensure that conversation gets spread out to all the areas we've talked about today. Uh, just to flag, we will be publishing a report next month on employment support and, and invites you to go out probably this week uh, to an event in the peer head in the Senate on that. So keep your eyes out for that. It's not the same conversation as this, but it is relevant about how we, we tackle things like economic inactivity in Wales. So please do keep an eye out for that. So on that note, then, uh, a final diolch an fawr. Thank you to everyone. That was uh, that was a fantastic conversation, and I hope you have uh, a good lunch and a good rest of the day. Thank you.